All right, so research to practice, North Carolina Cancer Challenge 2020, Improving Enrollment in Cancer Clinical Trials with Emily Olson, CCRP, and Alicia Bilheimer, MPH. Emily has worked in clinical research at UNC Chapel Hill for 12 years in various roles, from study coordinator to research program manager. She has demonstrated, she has a demonstrated history of planning and implementing and overseeing projects in a variety of clinical specialties and has been a certified research professional since 2013. Currently, she's head of the North Carolina Translational and Clinical Sciences Institute. Uh, we know it as NC Tracks, helping to promote awareness on the importance of clinical trial participation, as well as to assist study teams in the optimization of re recruitment planning. And there's more information there, but uh, we want to go ahead and welcome you, Emily. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Excited to be here. And Emily, what's one thing we should know about you outside of that professional bio there? Um, I would say right now, probably the most relevant thing is that as good as I am at recruiting research participants, I think my biggest challenge right now is convincing my three-year-old to put on his shoes and, and coat in the morning to leave the house. So everyone's got their challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And then I know from personal experience that can be a big one. Uh, <laughs> so good for you. All right. Thank you. And then um, we also have uh, with us today Alicia Bilheimer. And Alicia received her master's in public health and behavior and health education from UNC Chapel Hill in 2010, and has worked in the fields of clinical research and community engagement for over 10 years. As a clinical research coordinator within Duke's Cancer Prevention Detection and Control Program from 2010 until 2016, she was responsible for project oversight for multiple community-based cancer prevention studies with local Latinx, African-American, and adolescent populations, as well as for clinical research unit oversight for all research compliant activities within the Department of Community and Family Medicine. There's more. I'll let you read that. Alicia, welcome. Uh, what about you? What's one thing we should know outside of your professional bio? You know, I think like everybody, I'm just dying to get outside and have lots of fun before, before COVID hit. Um, my husband and I love to go see live music. We've seen probably close to 200 shows over the past few years, and that was the last wow. thing we did the night before the stay-at-home order. So I'm ready for COVID to be over and, and to get back out. Well, what, very good. What would be your dream show when the first time you get to, uh, to go back and watch That's a show? good question. I was actually thinking earlier, what was my favorite concert? And I go back to one. I saw Stevie Wonder about 10 or 12 years ago, and Prince came out. For, for wow. one song, it was amazing. So it would be that. I've already seen it. Okay. It was, okay. Again. Good. <laughs> Good. Well, now I'm seriously jealous. That's that's amazing. So. Well, thank you both for being here. Um, I, I mentioned poll everywhere. So our first poll everywhere question is: uh, We try to make this one kind of a softball. Clinical trials are medical studies that help find new ways to prevent, detect, or treat diseases that are safe and effective. And if you feel that's true. Uh, vote for that if you feel that's false. Vote for that A or B if you're using the texting option. Uh, while we're waiting, I'll say this activity has been planned and implemented under the sole supervision of the course directors in association with the UNC Office of Continuing Professional Development. William A. Wood, MD, MPH, and CPD staff have no financial relevant relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. Emily Olson and Alicia Bilheimer have no financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. And let's take a look at that poll. So again, clinical trials are medical studies that help find new ways to prevent, detect, or treat diseases that are safe and effective. Uh, we already seem to be trending in one direction. Again, this is anonymous. Uh, take take another five seconds or so if you haven't answered this one. Uh, we seem to be uh, pretty heavily leaning in one direction on this. Alicia, Emily, how are they doing? I think they got it. Makes me very happy. <laughs> good, good. All right. Thank you all for participating in the poll. North Carolina Cancer Challenge for 2020, improving enrollment into clinical into cancer clinical trials. All right, and uh, I'll let you all take it away. 
Great. Thank you so much. We're really excited to be here to chat with you all about this today. Um, we have several objectives, and I will sort of give the disclaimer that I tend to err on the side of more information. I get really excited about this topic and about talking to people about it. Um, so there may be some things that we, we skip over a little bit today, uh, but certainly, I mean, I think each of these objectives is probably its own hour-long talk in and of itself. Um, so our contact information, both mine and Alicia's, is at the end. Please feel free to reach out after this if you want to discuss anything further or additional resources or questions uh, beyond what we have time for today. We would be delighted to, to continue the conversation. So today we're going to talk just a little bit uh, about the importance of clinician to patient awareness and acceptance of trial participation, uh, about the trial recruitment process itself, um, ways that uh, clinicians and non-researchers can incorporate uh, engagement strategies into their day-to-day -day practice and their day-to-day -day lives. Identifying resources, so if someone is interested, where can you send them, where can you get more information? Um, and then also talking a little bit about the diversity disparity in research and some specific strategies and engagement uh, techniques that can, can address that. Uh, among them, community engagement, which is where Alicia's uh, expertise really, really comes in. Uh, next slide. So the first thing I would love to know from you all uh, is a little bit more about who you are. Um, how do you interact with research? Um, if you would just take a few minutes, uh, A, B, or C. A is I am a researcher myself, or I'm a clinician at a practice where we actively conduct research, or a clinician at a practice where we do not. Great. Thank you all so much. That's really helpful. <laughs> um, so it looks like we're, we're about tied for um, those of you who are actively engaged in research yourselves um, and clinicians who are at practices where research is being actively conducted, which is fantastic. So I will shift the tone just a little bit of what we're talking about here today as we go. Um, and for those of you at a practice where recruitment is not regularly integrated, there's a lot of really wonderful information still here for you, because um, the focus here really is more on the clinician engagement side. So how can you interact with your patients on a day-to-day -day level uh, to complement the more traditional research and recruitment approaches? Uh, next slide. So the first thing I want to just touch on very quickly is what we mean by research. Um, so certainly today we're talking more specifically about cancer clinical trials, um, but I think it's always important to note when you're approaching these conversations with your patients and potential research participants, uh, the research is involved in a trial and testing out a new treatment and receiving, you know, the option of being randomized to one intervention or another. Um, and this, you'll see that this is part of what we encourage with the engagement is helping to meet patients where they are. Um, if it is that they want to be introduced a little bit more softly to research and maybe they want to join a registry to start um, or be involved in a survey study where they are sort of sharing their opinions and their thoughts, um, that those can be really great introductions to research and a really great sort of first step to kind of get their feet wet uh, and become familiar with the process and with the concept. Um, also, you know, thinking about what's important to different people, um, depending on where they are in their life, uh, in their medical care, uh, in their disease progression, um, these study aims also might vary uh, depending on their motivation, right? So some might be driven by the, um, the desire to help prevent cancer and to really identify those factors and, and different ways that you can assist in prevention, um, whereas others really might be more focused on the treatment um, and want to consider that alongside the more traditional care options as, as an option themselves. Um, so I think it's just important to sort of frame your own minds that way and remember that while we are focused typically on uh, clinical trials themselves, um, there is a much broader base of research available, and we want to make sure that participants and potential and patients are aware of that. Next slide. So why are participants so important? Um, many of you may know this, particularly if you're researchers yourself, um, but in 2015 analysis of registered trials revealed that 19% of them were closed or terminated early 
solely due to the fact that they could not enroll enough participants. Um, and as many as 86% of trials don't re reach their recruitment targets within the specified time period. So as you can imagine, this has a lot of implications, um, both from scientific standpoints and financial standpoints, as well as from ethical and public health standpoints as well. So, you know, what does it mean for the 10 patients that you did enroll into the study uh, if you can't meet your sample size of 50? Uh, and so if that data really can't be used, if you haven't met your sample size to really get the data that you need, what are the implications of that and of um, the impact on the 10 people that were enrolled? And thinking, too, from a public health standpoint, this is where we're going to talk about diversity a little bit later on, um, but making sure that as we are testing new treatments and, and enrolling into trials, that we're um, really making a conscientious effort to uh, have a diverse sample. Um, as you will all probably know, um, treatments and various medications have different, can have different implications on different races, different backgrounds, different age groups, um, different biological makeups. And so making sure that all of those groups are represented in the testing phase uh, is really important long term to make sure that we're bringing treatments to the market and understanding how they're going to impact uh, the public more broadly. The biggest thing here is that without the participants, the best ideas could go untested. Uh, you know, we could have the most amazing treatment uh, proposed and in trial. And if we can't get people to participate in it to help us get the data that we need to really test it, uh, you know, that idea doesn't go anywhere. Uh, and we're not able to sort of move it along in, in the process. And so the participants really are the most critical part, certainly in my, in my biased opinion, but the most critical part um, to the success of any trial. Next slide. So we are not going to go into a ton of detail here, um, but the more traditional recruitment methods um, typically are done by individual research teams. So the team itself, they have one study that they're focused on. They have staff that are either out in clinics or doing other kinds of outreach to try to recruit for individual studies or individual trials. Um, primarily in this case, recruitment is being considered once the study has launched. Um, and so it's sort of that active part where most people think about recruitment, right? Flyers and approaching people in clinic and um, doing cold calls, mailing letters, those kinds of things. Um, but I do want to explain sort of how the needle is changing, is moving a little bit, um, and how all of you can help to improve this process by empowering the patient. Uh, what we want to talk about today is the traditional recruitment as part of a bigger picture and a larger context of engagement. Um, so there are two kinds of recruitment. This is the first, the traditional recruitment. And the second is really more the engagement aspect, where we are having a conversation, we're empowering the patient and providing them with the information that they need to make an informed decision. Uh, and ultimately also to help to impact the research itself. Alicia will talk in a little bit about how we're encouraging research teams to engage in the design phase of their studies and in the conception phase of their studies to make sure that they're considering their population uh, and they're taking those perspectives into account and getting input from the people that they're going to be asking uh, help from as participants. Next slide. So just some examples. We talked about this briefly, but a standard recruitment method. Um, these are your standard things, putting up flyers, approaching people in clinic, letters, cold calls, radio advertisements social media, those kinds of things. They're all incredibly valuable and can be very effective ways to recruit for individual studies. Um, however, it's incredibly problematic if this is the entirety of it. Um, so we really want to start the process earlier on. Um, if we come in at this point where we have the study, it's already ready to go, and we're simply showing up and saying, hey, here's the study, do you want to participate in it? What we're really missing is is everything that leads up to that and the context that the patient is coming into that conversation with. Um, this can actually kind of compound the mistrust and the perception that research is predatory, right? Um, it, it also compounds the fact that the perception that research exists outside of the clinical setting and is really an other, right, and is not part of the, of the, the system as a whole. Um, and so the more that we can engage the participant earlier on in the conversation and normalize the idea of research as a consideration um, really is going to boost the effectiveness of all of these methods as well once we get to that point. Next slide. So just something to consider um, is the context. 
So we would need to remember that all the traditional methods exist within the noise that the patient is coming from. Um, you know, the patient is going to come in with their own preconceived notions um, from a variety of different places. You know, when you're recruiting, you're up against all of these different factors. Um, so things that are coming out in the news, which more than often are negative, unfortunately. It's sort of things that, mistakes that happen um, that are promoted widely in the news. Um, friends and family may be implementing and sharing their experiences with individuals. Um, certainly the history of research is a consideration, particularly when you're thinking about some of the more underrepresented populations in research. Um, so you just want to think about what else is happening, right? What else is this patient already coming in with? What other information? Um, and how much of that might be misinformation that you have the opportunity to expand um, and answer questions to be able to, to correct some of that misinformation? Uh, next slide. So you'll see this pop up a few times here during the conversation, um, but the research as a whole is really trying to move in the direction of being more patient-centered and more engagement-focused. Um, and so you'll see here, as you think about the different levels of engagement, um, you have the person who has little or no knowledge of research, like they know nothing, right? They've never been introduced to it. They don't really have any idea of it as a concept. Um, the next step up would be someone who is open to it. They want to take a little more active role. They want to learn more about it. What is this? Is it right for me? How does this fit into my, my care and my life? And then at the third rung here, you have the people that are then ready to engage as a research participant. Um, so I think the really important thing to note is that a lot of those traditional recruitment methods start at rung three. Um, and really these first two rungs, one and two, are where we have an opportunity um, in the clinical setting to begin that conversation and to present them with this knowledge and with this information to answer questions to start that conversation. Next slide. So um, let's consider our audience. When asked broadly and theoretically if uh, they would be willing to consider research participation. Uh, a 2019 survey indicated that 85% of people are open to it uh, and would be willing to consider it. Uh, among the reasons they gave for willingness to consider research uh, and motivation to participate are helping to advance science and treatment, uh, to help others, so that altruism fact, to receive money and compensation, uh, or to obtain a better or different treatment for their disease or condition. So just things to keep in mind as you think about what people have indicated as reasons for why they would be willing to consider it uh, and willing to have that discussion. Next slide. So we'll see here, and this is uh, reflective of the industry more broadly, typically only less than 10% of patients actually end up enrolling in trials uh, or in research studies. So what's happening there? 85% are willing to consider it, willing to participate, but when it comes down to it, to the brass tacks, only 10% actually enroll. So there's a lot of things going on. Um, you can see here that uh, for cancer trials in particular, the average in 2019 was about 8.1% participation rate. At academic sites, higher, which is understandable. There's generally greater infrastructure there, um, and generally patients are being approached more often. There's a higher concentration of research happening at those sites. Uh, at community sites, it drops to 7%, and some of these barriers here below are um, uh, contribute to that, right, to so the structural and clinical barriers. Um, you know, things like, is there even a study available for me? Is there anything happening right now that addresses my condition? Can I get there? Can I, can I reach this site, or is it three hours away? Um, but what we're going to talk about today are really the patient and clinician factors, these things that we have the ability to influence uh, a little bit more directly and a little bit more immediately. Next slide. So I'd be curious to know what you all think. Um, and I think there's a poll everywhere question inserted here, um, but a 2017 poll asked the public, uh, why don't people take part in research studies? So I would love for you all to submit one word answers and we'll see sort of a word cloud. What, what barriers, why would people not participate in a study? What would their concerns be? Um, I'm curious to see how you all respond versus um, what their responses were. Right. And again, just, just go ahead and put in one word, if you would. Uh, we can't pick phrases in this, but single words will work, and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll see the, uh, the words that are repeated the most frequently mm -hmm. be the, the largest. 
that uh, true probably was an, an overflow from one of the earlier questions, so apologies for that. <laughs> And if you would take yeah. about uh, 10 more seconds, again, just to put a, a single word answer there. All right, Emily, this is interesting. And thanks to everyone for participating. Great answers here. Yeah, this is really wonderful. Um, so you all touch on a lot of the things that come up, and that's great to see that, that you all are aware of some of the concerns that people have coming in. Um, so if you would uh, advance to the next slide, we can take a look at how your answers then compare to um, what the public responded. Um, so not aware and lack of information is actually one of the top reasons that people give for not participating. They just don't know what's out there. Um, they don't know what's available. They don't know how to access it. It's overwhelming. Um, and so I think that's a really important thing to consider is sort of that broader piece of um, beyond these other reasons as well, just that lack of awareness and information is something that we really have the ability to impact. Um, lack of trust and too risky. Uh, a lot of words came up in your word cloud that address these two factors, which are absolutely valid, and they come up very frequently uh, in conversations. Again, these are things that we can address um, just by starting the conversation earlier on. I think a lot of times the lack of trust and the perception that it's too risky uh, is due to the lack of information, right, or due to a misconception or just to the fact that they haven't had the chance to talk to anybody about it and to really ask questions about the process uh, and learn what their rights are and learn what the protections are and learn what the options are. Um, again, there, when you look at the too risky and the adverse health outcomes, a lot of people assume that they have to jump right from never participating into, you know, a, a phase three treatment trial um, where they're going to be randomized. And there's a lot of room in there in between um, to really give them some positive experiences with research and to help them to gain an understanding and build trust um, and understand what their rights are there. Um, privacy issues is another big one. Uh, and certainly too much time, um, which can be addressed in study design, but, but is one that is a little bit harder to, to touch on. Uh, next slide. And this one we don't have to spend much time on, but just to give you all an idea. So that 85% is here on the left side of the screen of people that are willing to consider research. And we lose people along the leaky pipe here throughout the, the process um, until we get to these final people on the right-hand side that have completed a trial. And so these are a lot of different reasons uh, that people will sort of disappear along the, along the way. Um, and in this awareness and engagement piece on the left-hand side, again, is where we really have the, the opportunity to make an impact. Next slide. Being proactive, um, engagement is a process, not an event. Um, so this middle piece, to just, just so that you're aware, is really better addressed by the individual study teams discussing individual studies, right? They get to talk more to the study itself and what's being asked and the elements. Um, but on the left-hand side, this is where the proactive communication can really set the stage and sort of frame that conversation and frame their receptiveness uh, when they're actually approached by a study team or when an opportunity becomes available. Next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about your role as clinicians. Um, so certainly, you know, on the researcher side, there are a lot of things that we can do to adjust recruitment and to increase that. But I wanted to make sure that we talked today in a way that incorporated um, things that you all could do, um, particularly those of you who are not on research teams directly. Um, so thinking about your role on a day-to-day -day basis and how it can impact the greater process. Um, from a research en enrollment standpoint, but then also the individual and sort of their openness and the normalization of research and just sort of making it a day-to-day -day thing and part of the conversation. Um, so part of this will depend on your role within any given clinic, right? And also, as, as we saw at the very beginning, what kind of clinical setting you're embedded in and how that aligns with the research enterprise sort of more broadly. Um, Timing and normalization, here what we want to ideally see is to sort of move the needle toward this just being 
part of the everyday conversation. Um, you know, there being information up about research and resources within the clinic that people, they see it, they're at least aware that it's, you know, an accepted part of the conversation. Um, and then for nurses, for physicians to be just chatting with patients about, you know, have you ever considered research before? Are you familiar with research? Um, and really just starting sort of at that, that broad level uh, to make the introduction. Transparency is another really important thing. I think it's that idea that we are all educated enough about research ourselves to be able to have a knowledgeable conversation with folks and to address their concerns and to address their questions um, is really a critical factor. Uh, we do see occasionally that there are some, you know, physicians and clinicians still within the health system that are suspicious of research uh, for various reasons. And, you know, unfortunately in that case, if a conversation is started, if the patient is asking questions, they rarely then get the opportunity to move beyond that initial question and to really fully consider it and get all of the information to weigh the decision themselves, uh, because often the conversation stops right there. Um, another consideration, of course, is time. Y'all are busy, right? <laughs> There's a lot happening clinically, and research is something extra. Um, and so thinking about how can we incorporate and give clinicians tools to incorporate it very quickly, very seamlessly as part of the conversation, um, and having that be distinct from asking them to recruit for particular trials um, and introduce individual trials and help the patient decide if, if that trial is right for them. Certainly that is also a really important piece, but I think that that also comes, based on what we've seen at least uh, here in Chapel Hill, um, a lot of that comes from incorporating the conversation and from normalizing the inclusion of research um, just into the culture of the clinic, not necessarily you know, into to the processes, uh, but just into the culture. Um, lay language in a shame-free environment, this goes hand in hand with, with clinical care, um, encouraging patients to ask questions, using language that's understandable to them. Something we see often with research teams is that we are so embedded in the process that sometimes research teams and people, you know, coordinators approaching patients forget that they need to take the language back a notch, that patients don't know what informed consent is necessarily. They don't know what randomization is. They don't know what a placebo is. And just being able to sort of pull back that conversation and use language that um, is friendlier and more accessible uh, to the patient wherever they happen to be on that, that spectrum. Um, considering and confronting your own personal opinions about research. So I touched on this briefly with um, sort of the variety of approaches that are out there and the variety of opinions that are out there. Um, what we encourage definitely is just being able to provide information. So whatever your opinions are uh, about research itself, like, you know, making sure that you're willing to just share information. Um, and, and be aware of that. And we'll talk a little bit too as we get to uh, the diversity conversation. Um, something that we find even with research teams specifically is that there's sort of this implicit bias. Um, and most times individuals aren't even aware of it, but they sort of make judgments themselves about would this person consider research or would this person be a good participant? Um, and that actually the opportunity is not offered. Uh, to that person um, because of these sort of implicit biases that um, are, are sort of difficult sometimes for us to sit down and really identify uh, and confront. Uh, the other piece is having resources. So we hear this very frequently, and I think I saw this on some feedback that had been provided from participants from previous lectures uh, in this series, um, is that often it's hard to help a patient find out where to go to get the information or to find an, a relevant trial. Um, and so oftentimes patients and, and clinicians feel like they sort of hit, hit this wall of, well, they're ready, they're interested, but I don't know how to get them to, uh, to the right people or to the right resource where they can explore this more fully. And then for those of you who are in uh, clinics where research is happening frequently, Tell research teams what you need. Tell them when you need them to back off and get out of the way. Um, I truly, research teams want to not impede the work, the clinical workflow. We want to embed ourselves alongside it and make it as easy as possible um, for these opportunities to be offered. And so if you need more information from them or if you need information to post in a waiting room or to be able to share via a newsletter, via my chart or something like that, uh, an electronic health portal, 
um, telling teams what you need and what's going to make it easiest for you um, to be able to share this information and to, to pitch individual studies if you're in a, in a practice that um, is engaged in doing that. Um, for some teams, it's having a summary sheet of the studies that are currently recruiting from the clinic. Um, for some teams, it's having individual information on each of those studies um, where physicians can then pull whatever is most relevant to their individual patient. Um, but really just that open communication with teams um, and with the more traditional methods of recruitment and saying, like, how can this work in our practice? Um, it's, everything's different. Recruitment is an iterative process, and the first thing that we try is rarely the only thing that we need to do, right? Um, we always encourage research teams to be incorporated, to be learning from their participants and incorporating new strategies and new uh, ways of having conversations based on what they're hearing. And we would hope that the same thing would be happening between practices and research teams um, to really make sure that those lines of communication are open. Uh, next slide. So I'd be curious to know how many of you uh, regularly introduce the idea of research to your patients. So whether it's a general discussion um, or offering a specific study. All right. And, 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 and for this, uh, it's not a word cloud, so if you want to put in a few words, uh, feel free to do that as well. All right, and we've got a lot of ground to cover today, so yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say maybe if uh, if we can take uh, just five or six more seconds. Uh, thanks for all these answers that are coming in. So it looks Good. like, Emily, we're trending yeah. towards yeses, but we've got some no's, some nays, yeah. and sometimes. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I'm happy to see that, that we are trending toward yes. That's, that's really wonderful. Um, so as you will see, this is probably not news to most of you, but uh, patients would prefer to learn about clinical research um, from their primary care physician or from a practitioner, uh, a clinical practitioner. So um, that is notoriously the most preferred but also most difficult way to recruit um, due to sort of those time constraints that we discussed. Um, the second option here is just educational information. This is the second. If, if we're not going to have a discussion, at least put the information out there for me to be able to access. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is sort of what's woven through the entire presentation here. Um, but the ability of your patients to engage will depend on a lot of factors and how um, readily you're able to incorporate this into your your daily clinical practice. Mm -hmm. um, but clinicians are the single most influential factor in patients deciding whether or not to participate in research. Um, so really empowering them is the goal and giving them the tools and the knowledge to drive their own choices because it's all voluntary. Um, next slide. Um, and we can actually skip over this, this question since most of you are introducing it. <laughs> you want to go on to the next slide? Um, and next slide. We've covered a lot of this in the conversation as we've gone. Uh, just a couple things of note, and this is all um, reported from actual cancer trial participants. Um, but these are barriers that are noted specifically to participation in the cancer clinical trial. Um, and as you look at this, a lot of this information, again, can be addressed with a conversation. Um, one thing that I really want to point out that we hear frequently is the misconception uh, that clinical trials are last-ditch last effort and that one should only participate after failing to respond on other things. And something that is important to consider is offering these trials alongside as part of the conversation. Um, it may not always be the appropriate approach, um, but the participant should be given, if it is a reasonable approach, the participant should be given the opportunity alongside their other choices to, to consider it. Um, the other thing that patients often uh, have a misconception about, particularly with cancer trials, is that they're not going to receive any treatment 
uh, if they are randomized to placebo. And of course, uh, as I hope most of us know, uh, with cancer trials, they will still receive standard treatment. You're not going to just let them uh, not receive anything, right? They're still getting the best standard treatment and standard of care available, um, but then there's sort of the addition of the, uh, the trial component. Next slide. And so this I'm going to maybe leave for a whole other conversation. <laughs> um, but these next slides you will have access to uh, to review yourselves. But really this is about uh, behavior change and how can you actually have the conversation with the patient? Where do you need to start? You'll see that this looks a whole lot like the engagement ladder that we saw early on, right? There are these different points at which the person is going to be open to information and where it's going to be able to drive uh, behavior change. Next slide. So one thing to consider is introducing research as a concept. Um, so we talked about this a little bit earlier, but just the general, are you familiar with research? Um, and having that be the starting point uh, before you get to the actual introduction of individual studies. Next slide. And just thinking about the emotions of change and how your patients might be feeling and how you can sort of drive the conversation to encourage uh, feelings one way or the other, right? Um, the resistance is often comes from this misinformation or lack of information, whereas the resilience and the motivation is going to come from these, these feelings of purpose and empowerment uh, and optimism and confidence that, that they have the information they need. Next slide. And again here, this just sort of drives behavior change, and this is really the core of why it's so important to incorporate these conversations into the clinical discussion, um, is that if they see that it is normalized, that it's part of their day, it's part of the clinical practice and part of the conversation, um, that they're being given the information, that they have the skills and the resources to be able to access additional information, um, and seeing that, that it's part of, of their practice uh, and of their care provision, uh, that that really sort of drives that behavior change and the consideration um, to to learn more and to dive in and, and take that next step to participate. Next slide. So I will leave these for you all to review on your own, but just sort of examples of how to pitch research, um, how easy it can be just, just incorporated into your day-to-day -day conversation. Um, Tim, you can go through the probably the next couple of slides here. So just some examples of how to have the conversation, how to introduce it. Um, next slide. And ideas that uh, for addressing some of the specific concerns that we saw um, about it being a last ditch effort and about people being a guinea pig, um, really just giving them more information to, to frame that uh, will be useful. Next slide. Uh, we can move, go ahead and move to the next slide after this as well. So uh, things that you will probably see as a clinician pretty frequently are these barriers. Um, there are institutional or clinic time constraints, um, treatment preferences based on your expertise, right? Um, thinking uh, about what you want to recommend to your patient for care. Um, these kinds of, of constraints sort of remove key opportunities for patients to have that conversation and to consider taking part in a trial. Um, and sort of surveys have shown that patients look to their doctors as a major source of information, and if they're actually offered a trial, they say yes more than 50% of the time. So really, it's just getting to that point of having the conversation and offering the opportunity. Next slide. Um, these are some things that you can consider. Um, these are, are constraints that you probably have experienced. Um, so I would encourage you to take a look and think about whether these are true for you um, and when they occur and why. Um, and then thinking about what can we do to sort of remove some of those barriers and to mitigate those, um, those problems. Next slide. 
Some things that you can do to incorporate um, inclusion of research recruitment into your practice is developing strategies that are realistic within your environment. Uh, we don't want you to feel pressured uh, and feel like you have to you know, take all of this extra time to do it, but finding ways where you can just easily streamline it and incorporate it. Um, the most important things here are visibility, knowledge, and transparency. So have it around, have it visible as part of the practice, um, and then also be knowledgeable and able to sort of answer questions. Next slide. And the diversity, I want to um, just touch on briefly as we get into our conversation here with Alicia on community engagement. Um, but it's not just about the target, it's about really making sure that you're offering the opportunity to everybody. You can see here 2019 demographics on participation rates um, by both gender as well as race. And it's large, um, large shift. Uh, next slide. And so Marjorie Charlot, who is the Assistant Director of uh, Patient-Engaged Research and Community Outreach and Engagement at Lineberger, uh, actually was kind enough to share with us some of the strategies that they use and they incorporate. She is, her focus is diversity uh, and in, in inclusion in research. Um, so some of these are, are barriers that are true for everyone, but particularly um, pertinent uh, for people of color and diverse backgrounds who have been underrepresented. Um, Next slide. So some strategies to boost inclusion and diversity um, and, and research uh, offering more broadly. Implicit bias and equity training, um, diversifying your research staff, making sure that you have Spanish speakers available, that you have um, a diverse staff so that people see people like themselves um, reflected in research and in the staff. Um, awareness of the context and where somebody might be coming from and what historical factors may be influencing their uh, perceptions of research. And the other thing that we see really frequently uh, and really successfully is participant navigators. Um, so people within a clinic who are able to sort of just be that point person uh, and able to direct people to resources and help navigate the process um, and the information that's out there about research and about trials. Um, and I do want to give Alicia just a couple of minutes here to touch on hers, but the other really important piece is community engagement. Um, so again, we think about this broader context, but we can take it even beyond the conversation with individual patients um, and think about how do we include the community and the populations more broadly um, and encourage researchers really to include that information uh, in those perspectives as they're designing their, their research. Uh, next slide. And um, if your patient is interested in research, do you know where to send them? Uh, yes or no? Be curious if you all know that there are where the resources are to connect people. All right. So if you would take just a minute, <laughs> this is just it should be just a yes or no. I'm not sure why we don't have the answers popping up the way they should. Um, given given that, I, and I apologize, we'll try to sort that out, but given uh, that, that oh, we're fine. running low on time, I think we should probably proceed. Yeah. For the next slide, here are some resources. <laughs> if you don't know where to go, uh, here are some great opportunities for you. Uh, Research for Me at UNC and Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center uh, both have listing websites. Research for Me at UNC also has a bunch of educational material uh, and engagement material. Duke and Wake Forest are also included here, um, knowing, recognizing that people are in different parts of the state and patients will have uh, different abilities to access research. Uh, there are also some national resources. So uh, CISRF is a nonprofit. Uh, people can actually call and staff will assist them in finding studies across the country or in their local area. Um, also, clinicaltrials.gov and the National Cancer Institute, each of these links goes directly to um, their listing websites. So would encourage you to sort of mark these and make them available to uh, your patients and to your communities. Next slide. And next slide. All right, Alicia, take it away. I think this is actually your slide, and then I'm the next one. Oh, so um, this, yeah. So 
the one here is really just to talk about researchers. These are, this is where, as NC tracks, uh, we work with researchers and research teams to help them figure out how to impact recruitment success. A lot of times when I talk to people, it's at this uh, circled phase here, the implementation where they're actually doing the outreach. Um, but it's really important to consider uh, your population and to consider the impact of recruitment at these other phases as well. Um, and one of the most critical ways to do that is community engagement. So particularly in the concept and design phase and in the analyze and disseminate phase, uh, working with your communities and with your populations to make sure that you've designed research that really speaks to them and makes it easy for them to participate. Next slide. Thank you, Emily. Um, yeah, so as Emily has alluded to kind of throughout this conversation, participant engagement on behalf of providers and clinicians really helps to facilitate the recruitment process. By engaging patients in a meaningful way, clinicians can help to build trust, rapport, communication, transparency, all of the things that, that Emily has mentioned so far around research, and in turn that enhances their perception of the research process and ultimately their, their willingness to participate. Um, but I think it's also important to note that these approaches can and should extend beyond engaging patients merely as potential research subjects and solely at the time of their clinical visit uh, to incorporating them more broadly as partners throughout the research process itself. Um, so this approach we commonly refer to as community engagement, and it's become a really key part of patient-centered research design over the past several years. Um, I have a broad definition of community engagement up here, which is really, you know, just the process of working collaboratively with groups of people affiliated in some way, shape, or form. Um, the definition that we use, you know, is, is broad and open to interpretation um, because engagement can really take a variety of forms depending on the research study and the different types of communities involved. Um, this is because engagement occurs along a spectrum or a continuum, and one size doesn't really fit all studies. Uh, so I've, again, I've included Emily's engagement ladder here, um, which she shared earlier, that highlights this continuum, I think, fairly succinctly and suggests that engagement may vary by person and by project. Next slide, please. Um, so before determining the types of engagement approaches that are best suited for particular studies, it's always important to determine who, what we mean by community. Who is the community writ large? Um, in health research, communities or stakeholders are usually the individuals or even organizations who are impacted by or invested in the project. And again, that can take many forms. Um, some examples are listed here to the right. Potential stakeholders can range from community leaders and community-based organizations to patients to providers to policymakers. And so when defining a study stakeholder, a study's stakeholders, we often encourage research teams to consider things like who will the research benefit? Those are the key voices you wanna have at the table and they might not always only be the people that you're aiming to recruit. Um, who has the insights that can best inform the research broadly and who are the gatekeepers? Who are the trusted sources within communities who can help advocate for your work and your cause? Next slide, please. So once key stakeholders have been identified, engagement strategies can be developed that vary in their level of involvement and commitment required. Um, and as detailed on the top row here with their red circle, they can range from simply commu keeping communities informed of a given study to consulting them in an ongoing way to solicit their feedback, to involving them as collaborators or advisors, for example, community advisory boards, to actually placing decision-making authority or ownership into the hands of the communities the project is aiming to help. The ultimate goal of all of these approaches is to ensure that the study is acknowledging and incorporating community perspectives and priorities. And at NC Tracks, we focus a lot of our effort on encouraging research teams to include patients at the farther ends of the spectrum, so as partners who collaborate meaningfully or, or drive the research itself. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to touch upon the benefits of engagement on my next slide, but first I just wanted to highlight the different ways that research teams can approach partnership and patient-engaged research design. Uh, so as you see here, patient partners can provide input at all stages of a research study, so from conceptualization to startup to implementation to dissemination. Um, and as Emily said before, engaging patients in the earlier stages of the study or even before the study starts can really help to pave the way for their involvement later on, and it can also serve as a gateway for their involvement in future studies. And as their engagement evolves, many of the barriers to participation, like mistrust or misinformation, can begin to fade away. So 
some examples of the way that of the ways that patients can contribute to projects are listed here in the little boxes, but range from helping to identify and understand health priorities to generating research questions and strategies to helping to develop um, user friendly study materials to serving as a member of a research team and carrying out the project tasks themselves, often having someone on your study team, as Emily said, that reflects and comes from the community who is a familiar and trusted face um, can go a long way. So while a lot of the work here falls primarily on research teams to execute, I think it's also important for non-research clinicians to understand the various roles that patients could potentially play um, in potential research opportunities, given that they are often approached as trusted sources of information and guidance. Um, related to research. Next slide. So we've alluded to some of the benefits that can be brought about by approaching research through an engaged lens, but I wanted to highlight them explicitly here and encourage everyone to think through how these might translate into your own clinical settings and among your own patient populations. Um, but broadly, by engaging stakeholders, study teams can gain a clearer sense of community priorities and needs and can tailor their approaches um, accordingly, the more relevant the research is, the higher the likelihood is that the community is going to want to participate and that the changes the study is hoping to implement will be sustainable and longer lasting. Having stakeholders involved who come from outside of academia encourages often the generation of new ideas and methods that, that researchers, folks within academic or clinical settings would not have thought of in the first place. And having early buy-in from patients can help ensure that the research is supported and advocated for by those it aims to impact, which in turn can facilitate recruitment and dissemination, help identify roadblocks and build trust. Um, there was actually a systematic review conducted in 2018 that identified 26 studies that compared the effect of recruitment using engaged versus non-engaged methods. And there was an overall 18 to 30% increase in enrollment for studies that, that um, valued engagement in their approaches. Next slide. Uh, so regardless of when and how a study engages patients in their research, we always recommend that researchers abide by what we call principles of community engagement. These principles can help form the basis of a successful partnership. And so while they're geared primarily toward community academic partnerships, I think that a lot of them really ring true when thinking about clinician-patient relationships more broadly. Typically, I'll, I read through these, but given we're tight on time, um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you all to, to read through them. But in general, um, they highlight the value that transparency can bring, transparency about goals and the involvement of stakeholders, um, placing value on long-term sustainable partnership and placing an intentional focus on building trust with your communities, um, and also kind of really having a, a, a base understanding that the community knows itself best and has assets and strength that it brings to the table. So the researcher does not know everything. The clinician does not know everything. The researcher is not the ultimate authority, but we place a lot of that authority um, on the community itself. Next slide. Uh, so in addition to applying the principles, we also emphasize the importance of um, for research teams to consider the ways that they can give back to their community partners. It's always important that they consider these issues up front to allow space in the budget for financial compensation or resources. So certain things to include, um, to consider include financial compensation at an hourly rate for their time, as well as compensation for things like transportation, parking, childcare. Um, also, capacity building and support. Many times stakeholders are interested in building their research skills more broadly. And so researchers can always help them by offering training or mentoring in areas of interest, um, or just ask stakeholders what they'd like to learn and how they'd like to grow and help them figure out what's needed. Um, it's also always important to consider stakeholders as long-term and equal partners, not just as a resource for outreach and recruitment purposes. I think a lot of study teams, you know, plug into communities only when they need to recruit. Um, and it's important to think about longer-term sustainable relationships, not just one and done projects. Um, and I'll transition it back to Emily for a summary. Sorry, that was so speedy. <laughs> Uh, no, and I think that's a great point actually to end on is that ongoing relationship, right? And I think that ties it back nicely to um, the role of the clinician in this conversation and in the relationship um, as, it, as it relates to research. Um, and so taking it really the, the full spectrum uh, and making it a cyclical thing and an ongoing conversation um, and getting sort of outside of that we need patients, we need, or we need participants, we need to recruit right now um, for this study is, is really sort of the takeaway message from all of this. Um, so there's a lot of information here. I apologize for the 
speed. Um, as I said, I get very excited about this. I could do an hour talk probably on each of the bullet points in this presentation. Um, so I'm happy to stay on for a couple of extra minutes uh, as well as to be able to field questions. But um, Tim, if you would forward a couple of slides to our contact information. And there's just a couple more takeaway points there, all things that we've covered. Um, here's our emails. Um, so certainly you are more than welcome to reach out individually. I would welcome the chance to chat with each of you uh, and have an ongoing discussion and a more tailored discussion about sort of what's going on in your practices, what barriers you're facing, and, and how we might be able to help. All right, and of course, uh, both the, the uh, PDF of the slides as, as well as the recording will be available, so we don't uh, expect you to read all of that right away. Um, we, and now is a, is a great time for our audience to go ahead and submit questions. We already have a few. Let me pop one of those up. Uh, hopefully that'll show up. There we go. Uh, what financial obligations do enrollees have in a treatment-type trial? Great question. That is a really great question. Um, the answer is it depends on the trial itself. Um, typically, anything that's considered standard of care uh, will be charged to their insurance or to you know, self-pay, whatever their typical source of payment is, uh, just as it would be normally. Uh, however, the majority of clinical trials do have funds in place to pay for anything additional. So any um, you know, scans that will be done where you're getting study data. Um, those are often paid for by the trial itself. And the cost of the medication is paid for by the trial itself. Um, often transportation costs are reimbursed um, and payment is compensation is provided to help reimburse them and thank them for their time and for their effort um, for sort of this extra initiative that they are taking to, to help out and to help get data. So the answer is a bit that it depends, and that can be a really big concern um, for a lot of patients. So it's a really great question. Um, if you're talking about individual trials, I would encourage them to uh, be knowledgeable to ask the research team that question, because any individual research team should be able to break it down very clearly for them ahead of time great. before they sign great. up. Emily, thank you so much. Uh, here's another. Yeah. Can you explain more about telling patients too much about research versus too little, especially in the context of trying to achieve a truly informed decision by a patient? Boy, another great question. That is. And again, I could, I could talk with you for forever about this. Um, so a little bit more, uh, part of it is sort of active listening um, on with the patient and sort of hearing where they are right now and helping to being able to identify what information they might need. Um, so if you say, you know, are you familiar with research? And they're like, oh, no, like that's, I don't have time for that. I don't want to be a guinea pig. Um, you know, then the, that's where the conversation can start and say, oh, well, you know, that's a really valid concern. Um, let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, you know, not all research means that you have to be guinea pig. Or in this case, you know, it's always your choice. It's 100% voluntary. Um, did you know that it's always your choice and that you get the chance to really talk through and ask all your questions ahead of time? Um, and sort of it, it's back and forth then with the patient of really hearing where they are and what information they might need. Um, I will address just quickly in the context of diversity, too. I mean, I have had patients pull out the Henrietta Lacks book in, a, in an appointment with me and say, you need to answer to this. Um, like, what, what does research, what has research done um, to protect me since this? And, you know, this happened. What, what, are you, what have you done about it? Which is fair and, and truly a very valid conversation to have and a really great opportunity um, for the research coordinator or the clinician um, to answer some questions about that. And I think always when we talk about the context of research and history, we want to be transparent but also to be knowledgeable enough to know what has changed and what, what safeguards have been put in place uh, as a result of this history um, and, and those kinds of things. So uh, depending on what context you're talking about, whether it's just the initial conversation or you're actually providing informed consent and giving more background, um, it, it's a little bit nuanced depending on the patient themselves or the participant themselves. But please reach out to me separately. Happy to have a more tailored conversation about your specific situation. Right, and that's that's fantastic that a patient would would feel that empowered and informed. Yeah, um, it was great. What, 
What what happens when an enrollee uh, has to drop out midstream in a treatment trial clinically? You know, what what happens clinically and financially when somebody does need to drop out? That's another really excellent question. Um, so it again will depend a little bit on the study. Um, it is always up to the patient though and the participant to decide if they would like to continue on a study or not. Um, from a safety point standpoint, each study has a safety protocol in place as part of their trial and as part of their protocol um, to be able to know what the implications of that are. Um, so for instance, in particular treatment trials, there may be concerns about stopping the treatment too abruptly, right? And so there may be a protocol to sort of titrate them down um, and make sure that they are removed from the study in a safe manner. Um, certainly, if they decide to drop out of the trial, it does not impact their actual care, you know, their sort of standard care at all. Um, they would be transitioned back to their study or to their, their primary care doctor or their specialist um, to continue their care there. Um, from a financial standpoint, uh, they would be paid for the time that they had committed thus far, and that's always laid out in the informed consent, sort of what the payment schedule is for compensation. Um, financially, they wouldn't be charged for anything additional. Um, you know, it would only be what had already been completed for the study itself. Um, but pay, participants always have the right to withdraw at any time. All right, and another question. Uh, do you confirm candidates have clinical trials coverage with their insurance before enrollment? Example, NC Medicaid does not cover phase one clinical trials. So this is a place where we, as a research um, enterprise, maybe do not do as good of a job as we could. Um, I, and just truly, I think this is something that we need to do a better job of educating research coordinators about for doing the actual enrollment um, and doing the informed consent. Um, so again, studies will vary depending on the team and the study design um, about how in depth they work with the participant ahead of time um, to check on their insurance coverage. The standard typically is that they would outline sort of what the expectations are and what the patient should take the initiative to check, right? You know, definitely call your insurance company, ask them about this, here's what to ask, um, and here's what the implications of, the, of whatever answer you get are. Um, so I think that's a really, really important thing and something we can certainly do a better job of as, as a research enterprise um, of helping to inform the patient about and really help them get the information they need on an individual basis. But I think here too, this is a great opportunity for clinicians to really be involved in that conversation as well and just make the partic potential participant aware um, that, that things like this exist. Um, and that they may need to double check that. And a lot of this is just giving them, empowering them to ask the right questions of the research team and to know what to ask. You know, we should be doing our jobs from the research side to um, bring all of this up proactively, uh, but as much as the patient can be empowered as well and to come with, with this kind of information, it's really useful. And I think the NIH and maybe NCI also have some really great resources on their websites of questions that participants should ask. Um, so like printouts that they can bring along to their informed consent or to a conversation with the team um, about what kinds of things they should be asking about. This is great. Emily, thank you so much. Alicia, thank you so much. You've both been brilliant. This has been wonderful. Uh, we have a couple more questions, but we're going to need to wrap up. I know we've already gone over time. Uh, let me um, say thankful. thank you to the citizens of, of North Carolina for uh, their support uh, streamlined through the, the legislature to the University Cancer Research Fund or UCRF and the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, we want to thank uh, Mary King, Veneranda Obore, John Powell for working tirelessly to make this and every one of our lectures possible. And thank you to, to each and every one of you who attended today for, for being here. We really appreciate it. Uh, we will see you in 2021. Stay safe, everyone. Good to see you.